All right, dude. Uh, thanks for hanging out. Um, I've been really looking forward to this conversation because, well, a little bit about yourself. Your name is Thomas Stewart. I'll ask you all about your what you do. But something that's really exciting for me is that I do know, and I'm not propping up my course at all. I swear to everyone listening, I'm not. But you are you are a student in my program, right? Okay, yep. cool. Yep. And I don't think I I didn't know that until. Um, my friend Hector told me. So, oh, yeah. all that said, you're a student, but you've you've got a really kind of unorthodox way of becoming a full time game developer. So there's a huge story there about how you went full time and and how you're making games from. I, mean, I assume you're making games from your office right there. Yep, this is it. Um, that's your life, man. Yep. And so I, I know that I want to hear all about your story and and the challenges and, and what you love about it, what you don't, all the games you're working on. Yep. So, all that said, who are you? Where are you? Yep. And what are you known for? What do you do? Uh, well, my name is Thomas Stewart. I'm known as the biggest, most famous, uh, most awesome Thomas in the game dev sphere. <laughs> and I like that's right. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm a full time game developer and fledgling YouTuber. I like to think of myself as like the ideal guinea pig for everyone who wants to quit their full time job to make indie games. Because oh, I funny. I used to work as a gameplay programmer at a studio based in LA. And then I jumped ship because I wanted to free up my schedule um, because my daughter was being born right at that time. And so um, since I quit my, my full-time job, I've released two games on Steam. I've ported games to Xbox, PlayStation, Atari, and soon Nintendo Switch. Um, and I'm doing all that by myself. And then along the way, I like to make transparent videos about my experience about quitting my job to make these games. So Sweet, dude. Okay, so links are going to be in the description for anybody who wants to follow you. Thomas has a really cool YouTube channel, and it, I would say that, yeah, you've got a guinea pig vibe, meaning like you you just put out content that it, you basically say, I don't know exactly what I'm doing here, but I'm going to tell you what I'm learning. Yeah. And I think that's really, really cool. Um, and that's that's what I've been telling a lot of people who want to get into YouTube and and anyone listening who wants to get into social media, which is just, you don't have to be perfect. Yeah. In fact, it's better if you're not. Um, so that you, when you're transparent about what it's like to learn and what it's like to learn to make games, people really gravitate towards that because most people, including me, and I've been doing this for a freaking decade, you're still learning every freaking day how yeah. to make games, you know? Yeah, exactly. And you can't be afraid to fail either. And I feel like that yeah. immobilizes so many people because they think like if they dive into game development, they have to, you know, do everything correct the first time. And I feel like it's through the failures that you actually get better as you go. But you just have to be right. able to mitigate the risk associated with that. Like not everybody should just go and quit their day job and see if they can make it making indie games because it's super, super yeah. hard. But yeah. For sure. So let's talk about, you know, where you are right now. And then we can sort mm -hmm. of talk about the story behind that. So yeah. you're, you're, you're making games full time right now. And you have a family. You just mentioned you had a, a baby girl. Um, what? How is that even possible? Most people think that's like a fairy tale. Like that's not possible. Yeah. Um, to sit in your home office or your bedroom and just make games, and let alone make your own games and let not someone else's games. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Exactly. Like a, like a studio. So. What are you doing right now? Are you full time right now? Yeah, I'm full time right now. Um, I'm making my own games, and my strategy is to. Uh, develop my own games and then mm -hmm. port them to as many platforms as I can so I've got like just sitting over here I've got like my Xbox dev kit my PlayStation 4 PlayStation 5 dev kit my Nintendo switch my Atari VCS and I'm trying mm -hmm. to distribute these games on to as many platforms as I can just so that I get like a trickle of income coming in here and here and kind of yeah. build up my back catalog yeah. of games um, so I'm doing that yeah. along with YouTube and um, Twitter X trying to like the thing the thing is about what I'm doing is I feel I feel pretty confident about my technical skills because I had worked mm -hmm. uh, a number of years at a game studio doing programming. Uh, but the things that I'm trying to figure out are like the business, the game design, the art, the marketing. Um, so those are the things that I'm trying to yeah. wrap my, my head around right now. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, you're doing a really good job. Um, I'm, I'm following your channel and I'm just seeing you grow so much. So in terms of income, you're you're trying to you're you're trying to build up a machine that will eventually bring in that income, correct? So exactly. you're not self-sustaining yourself right now. Is exactly. that true? Exactly. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. So yeah. And I, I talk about this in some of my YouTube videos. Is I did a lot of preparation before 
jumping ship from my day job. Um, Mm -hmm. I I basically spent probably a year um, kind of getting a real solid grasp of my family's finances, like spreadsheets and spreadsheets, you know, here's all of our debt, like student debt and like... um, like here's how much we're spending on groceries every month, et cetera, et cetera. I, I detailed everything, um, and then I figured out, okay, this is like what we would need to be uh, to sustain ourselves, and yep. out of that, you know, pay down some debt, uh, put away some some um, savings so that I have this financial runway so that I can try and use that. It's basically borrowed time in my eyes. It's borrowed time so that yep. I can really put in the full effort to. Um, build up this machine that will bring in this passive income as I release games. Exactly. You know, I, by the way, I did the same thing. Um, my situation, well, I don't know if it's the same thing, but my situation was I had built up some savings off of like, I don't know what it was. It was like a publisher deal or something where I had some savings and we were burning through that and my wife was working and she was paying, she was paying like the regular bills. Mm -hmm. And so all of that savings I wanted to keep there just in case there was an emergency or something. And so my wife was there, she was supporting us for about a year, I think. Uh, But now she's, now she's stay at home mom and I'm, I'm doing all the supporting and things have really turned, turned around for us because, um, not only am I able to support my family, I'm able to hire out people and support other people's families. Not that I'm doing the work, but mm-hmm. be- because of that machine that you mentioned, because of that machine, um, I'm able to, to, to provide multiple salaries, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. So a good, a good question to ask here, and then I, w- I wanna get into how you did it and how you got to where you are now. Mm-hmm. A good question is, would you recommend people listening to do exactly what you're doing, which is go out on a limb and take a big old risk. Yep, uh, I would say absolutely not, <laughs> but <laughs> with, with, with a caveat. Uh, yeah. So I would say what I'm doing, like I said, I feel like I'm a guinea pig. I'm trying to build in public. I'm trying to do what I'm doing as kind of an experiment because I haven't seen yeah. too many indie devs take this path. Typically, it's like the hobbyist dev that's you know, working one or two hours a day on their game for years, and then they have one game, they try and make a big enough splash on their launch to be able to quit their day job. And that's yep. that's kind of what I've seen a lot across um, the, the game development sphere and YouTube and things. Um, what I'm trying to do is a little different, and it's not proven yet. And, and I think the biggest difference is I'm really trying to focus on finishing games. I'm trying to focus on small scoped games. I'm trying to limit the amount of time that I'm spending on one single project so that I have these multiple titles out so that even if they're not bringing in, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, I still have some income that's coming in every single day from all these different locations. Um, So in in my head, it makes sense. Um, The jury's still out to see if it's a viable (laughs) career path. So we'll see. Yeah. Well, I mean, the thing is, is even if it's not a, a viable career path, it's like you're going to learn so much, dude. Yeah. You know, and in, in this time, you're going to learn so much. There's multiple streams of income, though, um, that if I were you and I'll, I'll list them out here just so you're aware. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got one of these loud candles. Let me blow it out. Um, my dog's barking. Sorry. Oh, no worries. Um, a couple viable income streams for you to consider. Um, how many views are you getting on YouTube right now per video? Uh, so I, I average like one to 3,000 views per video probably. Yeah. Um, okay. I've, I've had a couple um, bigger ones that have crossed the 20,000 threshold and then I have one video mm-hmm. that has done uh, six feet, like over 100,000. Um, so that's... so. Have but, you taken any sponsorships? Uh, I have done two sponsorships. One is did they, oh go ahead. I was just gonna say, did they pay you a hundred bucks? <laughs> One of them, what I don't know if I'm allowed to disclose. It was it was less than a thousand, um, more than a hundred, and mm-hmm. the other one That's good. was yeah, it was great. Um, and then the other one was a, a product, and that was that a was, product review. Yeah. Because I, I actually reached out to them because it was actually really awesome. Um, it's mm-hmm. it's kind of one of the intangible benefits of having a YouTube channel is I work yeah. off of a laptop and one day my laptop screen crapped out on me, uh, but it would still work if I plugged into an external monitor. 
So I reached out to this company who sells um, portable external monitors, basically like the size of an iPad. And I said, hey, uh, can I review this on my YouTube channel? And you said, yeah. <laughs> so, so they sent me like $900 worth of gear and I felt like I robbed them. And I just am giving them like a, a 30 second plug in, in my video, so. Yeah. yeah. Oh man, okay, so, you know, you could definitely, uh, definitely take, you, you should be able to land a sponsorship per video, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, that's what I did for a while. I, I think I got like 500 bucks a pop. So every video was like 500 bucks. And that was like with like uh, five to 10,000 views per video. Yeah, so that's that's one stream of income, which is with YouTube, you know? Yeah. So if you really wanted to, you could probably bring in two grand a month by yeah. just doing YouTube videos. You probably could. Um, then you could also use your YouTube channel to secure wish lists for your game, yeah. you know? So that's another way. Yep. Um, but are you are you planning on doing small like mobile games? No, um, I, I don't want to go into the mobile market because I, from from what I've seen, I mean, I think Apple Arcade is a bit different now, uh, but I, I started my hobbyist game dev journey making mobile games and realized that the market is super saturated and the monetization models are very different. So I, I really like the um, the business model of selling premium games on PC and console. Okay, so your your goal is to make small Steam games. Yep. I start, and console and console yep, games. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And, but so, I, I also I'll say this: I don't want to start small, or, or I don't want to stay small. I want to start small, and then yeah. every new project that I take on, I want it to be a little bit bigger. Um, mm -hmm. but I, I just don't want to bite off more than I can chew. I want to make sure that I keep finishing projects. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And also it's, 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 um, it's kind of like releasing little tests into the market to see like, does this kind of game work? And am I good at this kind of a game? Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. Am I good at this kind of a genre? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Because I, so, I see a lot of people put all of their eggs into one basket of a game. Uh -huh. And if it flops, that's what it's I do. like, man, that's that's so rough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what I do. And it's it's not it's not fun. Yeah. But, but you know, you can... Um, I got lucky because when I started releasing games, I immediately found my forte and like found what my games what made them shine. Yeah. And so I didn't have to search and figure out what I'm good at. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and release a bunch of games to figure out what I was good at. I, my first game I released was atmospheric. It was moody and it was a story game. Yep. And that right there, everyone, that's what people loved and that's what I love. Yep. And so it just automatically just worked out. Um, and that's all I do now. So like a decision I made when I was 18 determined my entire portfolio style basically you yep. see directors get locked into a style right like yep. uh like tim burton he can't get away from his style yep and i maybe he wants to but why would he you know yeah um and so for me i i think every game developer they need to figure out what their voice is and what exactly. their style is exactly and do you feel like you figured that out yet or is that part of this process no i don't think i figured it out and i think it makes sense because like for you, you are a good artist and a good storyteller. And for me, I, you know, my background is in programming. So I feel like my, my default mindset is more linear. And um, like you often talk about, you know, the Trinity hook of having like a, mm -hmm. a, a narrative hook and a mechanical hook and a visual hook. And I, I think things like a, a visual hook and a narrative hook are very easy for you. But for me, I think it's easier to have... Um, like a mechanical hook because I can go yeah. deep into the code and um, make fun gameplay. But the problem with that is that uh, I think with a mechanical hook, it's harder to market because usually you need to get hands on to see like a mm -hmm. mechanical hook a lot of the time. Some, sometimes you get it when you see it, but sometimes it's like yeah. you have to be playing it for the mechanical hook to make That's sense. That's right. So, I agree. I agree yeah. with it, especially with more like, uh, like Dark Souls, for example. It's like the hook is that it's brutal, Yeah, I, I think. Um, it's just awful and horrible and it's the worst game ever yep. and I'm being sarcastic but not really because I <laughs> I, yep. I can't play those games I'm not very good at those games but um, but that's the hook the hook is it's brutal so the question yep. is how do you how do you communicate that yeah and exactly. um, a lot of times it's done with the visual hook you know like yep. portals visual hook is the same as the mechanical hook yep um, 
So, so you're still trying to figure that out. Yeah, I'm now, trying to figure it out. I have like a very simple, like stylized art style that I like to go for. Like, I, I think I'm trending towards like uh, kind of cozy gaming, more casual, cozy, yep, yep. like, you know, light a candle, get a cup of tea, those kind of games. Um, but I'm mm-hmm. still trying to figure it out. Do you think that I just having this, this conversation with my publisher, it was such a good conversation. Um, my publisher said that the most important aspect of a game is the fun factor. Mm -hmm. And my question is, do you agree with that? Wow. That this is actually a super philosophical question because it's like, I know I I really want to hear what you have to say. Yeah. Because I, I told him, I said, I don't know if I agree. Right. And he said, he was like, at the end of the day, the games that in terms of monetary gain, the games that blow up, they're just fun it doesn't mean they're not beautiful it doesn't mean they're not cozy yeah it doesn't mean that there's not a good story but above all yeah they're fun right but even in that rationale did you catch that they said it's the fun games that blow up so it's almost like it's almost like if you could find something else that would make a game blow up then would that be the most important thing that constitutes a game i don't and, and what i think is i don't think there's anything yeah. I, like I, I agree with I, I do agree with him after our conversation because it's like I focused on story I focused on mood and music yep. for my previous games yep. they made me money yep. I they I went full time and it's like close to a million dollars in gross revenue for these games or mm-hmm. I think it's more than that and but that's not blowing up yeah that's yeah. good but yeah. that's not blowing up the games that blow up are the are sometimes they're stupid. Yeah, you know sometimes totally. it's like stupid ragdoll games. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. It's, where the player has creativity and they have fun. And so you're saying, well, I love these cozy games. Yeah. Well, are they fun? And should they be fun? Yeah. Or should they just be cozy? What yeah. do you think? Like, yeah, I. The hard thing about any medium, especially games, is a lot of it is built up on preference. And I think that there is strategies for marketing that you can implement that captures a larger audience, right? But Mm -hmm. I don't think that there's necessarily a right or wrong unless you're measuring it by like sales or dollars, right? But it it is like an artistic medium. Like for instance, um, the game that I just launched, Bridges and Docks, it's like a it's like a cozy island builder game and some of the feedback that I was getting on like my devlogs and uh, things that I was putting out online is um, like what's the point of this game you know like there 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 were no objectives um, there was no gamification Um, you know it's like um, it's in the same genre as um, townscaper if you're familiar with that game Mm -hmm. you just Mm -hmm. you just place blocks you know you know you build these like beautiful environments and some people love that you know it's the same kind of people that love playing with legos or like the creative mode in minecraft Um, but some people it just doesn't click for them they want an objective and they want to complete that objective you know and like have this Mm -hmm. sense of progression and i don't think that there's necessarily a wrong wrong answer for it it's just right sometimes it's a little more niche and sometimes you capture a bigger demographic by the type of gameplay that you have did did bridges and docks perform as you wanted it to um i actually yeah that's a good question so i have i actually haven't made my devlog uh covering the launch of the game yet um Mm -hmm. it it made about uh two thousand dollars on launch week which was okay. which was bigger than my last launch actually on Steam. Um, so you're making progress. Yeah, but but Steam actually isn't what I would call my primary platform. Usually I launch mm-hmm. it on Steam first because I don't expect it to bring in as much money as um, as the console platforms that I'm porting it to, and it's easier to patch and give updates. So I use, I, mm-hmm. I almost treat it like a soft launch. I, I do all the marketing beats. You know, I reach why out to you, streamers. Uh, why and, do you Why do you think that console is going to make you more money? Um, experience, I guess. <laughs> I, I think I think that there. I think in Steam, there's uh, more saturation. And in consoles, it's it's hard to get on consoles, and a lot of people don't think it's worth your time unless you. So you've you've done better on console than Steam mm-hmm. in your experience. Mm-hmm. Which yeah. game? Which game did well? Or oh, did so, better so than I only, Steam? Yeah, so I only have one game uh, that's on all consoles right now. That was my first game, and it's called Tanks, but no tanks, and it's a mm-hmm. a local multiplayer shoot 'em up game. 
Oh my goodness. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so that did better than Steam. Mm -hmm. uh, according to Chris Zakowski, twenty to thirty percent. I could be wrong here, but it's some low number. Tw twenty to thirty percent of most games revenue is console. The rest yep. is Steam. Yep. So that's the typical. The typical yep. for people listening is Steam is usually where you get your money. Exactly. I just had a phone call with my publisher and they said priority number one is Steam. Above all, it's like, you know, nose in your computer and focus only on Steam. Do not even look up for yep. console is the attitude. Yep. And so what you're saying is unorthodox. Yep. And I'm not sure I understand it. Yeah. But if that's your experience, I can't argue with it, you know? Right, yeah, it's, it's super, <laughs> I, it is unorthodox because nobody is doing it this way because most people need to make hundreds of thousands of dollars per game, right, or millions, you know? They, they're trying yeah. to make a ton of money for each title that they launch. I'm just trying to make an, a meager income for one person, right? So I don't, yeah. I don't need to take a huge chunk of the market. And I think with Steam, it's very competitive. You know, they have like ten to twenty games launching every day, or something like that. And uh, the market on Steam is saturated because the barrier of entry is lower than on consoles. And so when you mm -hmm. when you put a game on consoles, you the lower threat, like you can launch on Steam and get zero sales, right? Mm -hmm. But I think that's harder to do on consoles. I think there's a lower threshold for the amount of sales that you get because you you get more organic exposure. Whereas with Steam, you kind of have to prove yourself that you're like a big game that people are interested in. But and then once you get to that level, you know you're gonna make a lot more money. But right. I think I think as a solo indie developer, I'm I'm just testing the waters to see if there are other ways to survive than just concentrating on Steam. Well, well, well. So let's. I'm looking at bridges and docks here. Um, oh, yeah. I'm gonna. I would love to offer my thoughts. I didn't. I roast your channel. Yeah, yeah. You, I roasted you, your YouTube channel, didn't I? You, you, you didn't uh, roast my channel. But what happened was, uh, you tweeted out uh, games that you wanted to play, like demos. That's and right. Prototypes. I played Bridges and Docks, and yep. I said this has the most potential. Yep. I remember in that video, I said it needs a loop. Yep. Did you add a loop? I. It's okay if you didn't. I won't be mad. I swear. I know. I I sort of added a loop. It, I I kind of met in the middle. It's still a very sandboxy, creative, open-ended game. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But what I did is I added objectives that you can complete, and mm -hmm. for the most part, it's almost uses like a tutorialization. So. Now you just start with, there's only one thing that you can do when you start the game. There's only one thing that you can click on and it's add a basic block to the to the level. And once you add some blocks, then you can add a tree and then you unlock houses yeah. and then you can add a house, you know, and then, and then it's like, okay, you need to figure out how to build a rope bridge because there's like a special way to use the bridge tool. Um, and there's like different, uh, the, the main facet that I think is interesting about the game is the procedural generation system. So once you unlock that I tool, think it's awesome. Yeah, I love it, it. it's super fun to play with. But uh, you, there's some tweaks that you can make to those configurations that um, make interesting island layouts. And so that's where the, the objectives start to get a little more, OK, I have to think about this. How would I generate an island that has like um, a bunch of trees or like higher tiles in certain locations or yeah. Um, so, so I kind I kind of added a game loop, but it's still mostly an open sandbox creative game. I got you. I got you. It's it's got the I would I would say that you have a strong strong sensibility for visuals. Actually, you mentioned that you're a mechanical hook guy. My what I love about this game is the the visuals. It's so beautiful. Thank you. Um, that the means colors a lot. are great, and the the way things look. I mean, it's got, obviously it looks like Minecraft, you know, it's got a Minecraft vibe. Mm -hmm. Minecraft is what you'd call, I think we would call it a sandbox game, right? Mm -hmm. It's a sandbox game. Yeah. But even a sandbox game hacks into the monkey brain, which is, and I, that's what I'm curious about. Does bridges and docks hack into that deep rooted desire to build power and to yeah. grow? It, I would say that's what Minecraft yeah. does because of the loop. Minecraft, sorry to interrupt you, but mine, uh, what yeah. I wanted to say was Minecraft. It's it's literally life. Right. It's day day night cycle, build up to survival, and be creative while you do it. 
yeah. and become powerful. Yep. And you basically just become the owner of this world. Yeah, exactly. With all of your crazy contraptions and tools and stuff and buildings. The question is, does Bridges and Docs hack into that that monkey brain where you want to become powerful and 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 defeat a a truly challenging objective? Yep. Uh, I would say no, it doesn't. And yeah. I, and I yeah, go ahead. And I wonder. Sorry to interrupt you. I wonder, is that can you make a cozy game that also gives you that sense of power? Yes. And that struggle. Yeah, definitely. I think of um oh man, what's that what's that game? Uh it's the game where you where you it's a top down two D game where you unlock blocks of islands um and you like chop down trees and stuff. What is that? Nah, doesn't matter. But I, I think that you can tap into that. Like I think there's very cozy like idle games. I think idle games tap into that because you yeah. like generate uh, more like points as you go or money or whatever. Um, yeah. But this is very much from my experience. People who play this game um, enjoy it because they start um, imprinting their own story onto what they're creating you know they're like mm -hmm. oh so actually maybe i'll make this hill here and this is where like the rich people live and then this is like the little peasant village down here and here's like a little fishing port area so yeah. it, i think it it a lot of if you have a good imagination and you like um and you like to build worlds i think that it's appealing like i've heard a lot of people talk about how they use it for or they want to use it for um like dungeons and dragons like creating an oh, environment and then taking a screenshot of it and using it for their campaigns. Like, okay, this is the environment you come <laughs> upon, you know, where do you want to go? That sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I look at, have you, I'm sure you've seen throne fall mm -hmm. from Jonas Tyroller. Um, he's got 13,000 reviews and yeah. here, here goes Thomas talking about money and how important it is, but that's a lot. That's a lot of revenue that's uh, a ton. for a, for a $10 game. Yeah. And, and I think it's got the same visual style. I think it's got a similar, just a sim, it's similar visual style and, and feeling. Um, but there's, there's a, a power dynamic to it. Yep. Where you, you build up your defenses and you slowly become basically the king of this world. Yep. You know, and I think that there's just something innate there that, that is so humid. And I just think about it, I go, man, how well would Bridges and Docs have done, or maybe Bridges and Docs 2, or whatever, yep. Yep. how well would it have done if there was that power dynamic, which is yep. build up your defenses, yep. you know? But then again, here I am turning it into some commercialized game that maybe that's not what you wanted and sure. that's not what you intended, you know? Well, I'll, so, yeah, I'll tell you what my intent was. My intent was to make an, a, um, military strategy tactics game where you move troops around islands and try and defeat enemies around different island environments that was my original game idea yeah and i'm still planning on making that game the problem was okay. i felt like it was too out of scope for what i could accomplish in a handful uh -huh. of months uh -huh. so this so bridges and docks is actually my halfway point to the game that i actually want to make basically okay yeah good that makes me excited because yeah. i look at bridge and Doc, bridges and docks and i say Man, this game can make a million bucks, but it needs it yep. needs that that that. Well, it need, for, let's talk about two things here. We're gonna turn this into a consultation call because yeah. I'm thinking about like you've got the system here. You've got this beautiful. I would actually use an isometric camera, by the way. I wouldn't use orthographic. Oh, or yeah. I'm sorry, um, perspective. Uh huh. I would switch it to orthographic. Uh huh. Um, do you know what I mean by that? Yeah, totally. Yep. I, there's something charming about that where everything's 45 degrees uh -huh. and 90 degrees, but that's yeah. what I would do. But no, the first thing is, is let's talk about fun factor. Yep. What could we do? What could you do? I'm interjecting myself into your game and I shouldn't. Oh, please do. What, please do. What would you, what could you do, Mr. Thomas, to make this, the fun factor go from cozy, a nice little four. And I'm, it's not a fun game. It's cozy. Yep. Well, what could we do to keep it cozy? but make it fun. Mm -hmm. What what is that what is that player experience? You know when the player laughs in a stream or when they shout or when they get mad? How do you create those experiences? Right now it's I'm sipping my tea. Yep. That's great. But what can we do to sip the tea and then chuckle and spit the tea back into the cup? <laughs> what are those things that we can do for bridges and docks or that next game? 
And there's a lot of things that you could do. Um, a lot of them could be, I would, I would think humor is the way to go here. Mm -hmm. um, everything is silly and funny and ridiculous, but still beautiful and still cozy. Mm -hmm. Have you thought of these things? Have you thought of in enhancing that fun factor and creating those moments? Yeah, I haven't thought about it as like a, a zany or funny approach, which I do really like, but I have thought about how do I make a this game include combat and construction, uh, mm -hmm. but still keep it with a cozy feel. And I yeah, and, and like one of the things that popped out to me is like one of one of the primary ways I thought about it is like making all the characters animals. I feel like that's like very common in like cozy Brilliant. games. Um, you know, Brilliant. like like what if everybody was a turtle and you had like a warrior turtle with a spear, you know, and you had to like send him over here and he was fighting like other turtles or different kinds of animals, you know, I think that that would be um, a really interesting way to go with it. Turtle craft. Yeah. Uh -huh. let's, see, let's see. Does turtle craft exist? I'm looking it up. <laughs> turtle craft. It does not exist. Oh, I would man. grab that now before this video goes live. <laughs> I'm going to buy the domain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that idea, Thomas. It, yeah. That That's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. And the turtles, um, you know, let's think they they um, they can turn into bombs and blow up, you yeah. know, and they have funny voices and they're for some reason they have British accents. Yeah. You know, there's just <laughs> right. so much you can do yeah. to, to enhance that fun factor. And it doesn't have to be zany mm -hmm. or stupid, yeah. but it can be just something that makes people go cock. Like if you can get a player to cock their head, you've won. That's all it takes. And there's nothing worse. You remember that uh, there's a there's a Bible verse where Jesus says, um, you, were, you weren't warm, you weren't hot, and you weren't cold, you were lukewarm, so I spit you out of my mouth, mm -hmm. right? He's, he's, comparing, he's comparing people to water. He's like, I don't want you to be lukewarm. And the same is true with a game. There's nothing worse than a lukewarm title that's sitting on a fence and it's just plain. Yeah. You, you, it, it I would rather what what my game is. be that's right. I would rather it have bugs and it's wild and it's it's broken than being just run of the mill. Yep. And so there's this um, there's something that happens to game developers where because they invested so much time in something, they get scared of throwing in those crazy things. And so yeah. two, three weeks ago, I said, you know what? The headshots in my game are officially going to explode confetti. That's the rule. Yes. And I just did it. Even though it's not grounded in reality, I just did it. And it's so fun. Anytime you get a headshot, confetti blows out of the player's head. And then I was like, well, let's make the blood green and blue and orange. Yep. And now it's just silly. It's just silly and fun, but the game is still serious and moody. Yep. But you're throwing in those fun factor moments that separate the game out from other games. Totally. And you I, know? I also feel like it. it's compelling for your game, especially because it's 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 like um i think it adds to that feeling of unsettling it's fun but it's also unsettling like uh -huh. what what are these right. things that i'm shooting that when they when their heads explode confetti comes out it's like this mix between <laughs> like like children's fun but also like yeah. grotesque and like turns mm -hmm. your stomach you know well it's contrast is what it is you know yeah. it's like uh the enemies laugh when you blow their head off well, it's like <laughs> why are you laughing so That's but awesome. there's something really disturbing about that but the same is true with bridges and docks or whatever you want to do next. It's like mm -hmm. you've got something that's grounded, it's solid, it's it's a great concept, it's clean, mm -hmm. it's it's uh, simple. Yep. What can you do to throw in contrast there and create yep. those twists and those pops that make make players go make players again cock their head and go, what was that? Oh, that was yeah. weird. Oh, that was crazy. Yep. Um, there's just so many things you could do here. Um, and so you want to do you, are you sure you want your your next project is going to be a military version of Bridges and Dogs? Is that kind of what you're thinking? I haven't started on it yet. Um, I'm still working on porting Bridges and Dogs to consoles, but mm -hmm. it that's that's the plan forward tentatively. I I'm very open to figure out. I might spend a little more time prototyping. Um, this is this next project is one that I plan to um, put together a prototype and try pitching to publishers. Um, mm -hmm. I've had a, a couple of conversations with publishers um, already, and I would like to find funding for this game, but um, we'll see how it goes. But there, there will awesome. be there will be more a, a period of prototyping and figuring out exactly what the identity of the next phase of this game is for sure. I'm trying to see. I'm sitting here 
I'm watching the trailer and I'm thinking, I wonder if there's just one thing, one thing that can make this game just like you cannot stop playing it. Mm-hmm. And maybe it is that way. I don't know. I, I, uh, I'm thinking about console. I'm thinking about your console launch. I'm like, if you could, if you could into, if you could put in some kind of loop that that is super rewarding, mm-hmm. the console launch would go gangbusters. Mm-hmm. But I don't know what that thing is. I'm thinking about the an economy of some kind, just yeah. like what a currency that you have to gather and farm, and then when you get a lot of it, you can do another thing. Is there a currency in the game? There's no currency. It's completely no. creative right now. Yep. So nice. everything's free. Yep. I'm sure. What would it be? What would it feel like if it things cost things? Have you thought about yeah. that? Oh yeah. Like mm-hmm. to build a house, you got to get five coins. Yep. And so, how do you get coins? Yep. I don't know. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think that that is actually a really good. The hard thing is, is like I'm trying to pick and choose my battles. My time is so limited, and I'm trying to bring projects that I envision to the finish line and really like i said bridges and docks is kind of it's it's a glorified level editor for the game that i want to make next but i mm-hmm. but i wanted to polish it get it out so that people can play with it because i know that there's a market for it that people would enjoy i don't think it's going to capture a large player base but um but it's just one one of those things that i'm trying to like bring in some recurring revenue yeah. while i'm building this bigger game so yeah yeah Sweet, man. Well, congrats on launching this. It, it's so cool. I love this game. I, I've always liked this game. I remember the first time I saw it, I was like, it's so pretty. So you yeah. did, a, did a really good job there. So what was, the, what was it like going from... You, where did you work when you were working in... You worked at a previous game studio, correct? Doing yeah. mobile games? Yeah. Um, yeah, we did a... What's it a, like working for a studio like that? I loved it, man. When I, when I first started learning game development, you know, I was just like watching YouTube videos, taking online courses and like um, trying to learn just the ins and outs of game development and then I got to the point where I had built up this portfolio of games that were very small kind of lame but it it demonstrated that I knew how to do the basics in Unity and I was able to leverage that portfolio of small games to get a full-time job at a game studio as a gameplay programmer and as soon as I started at that job it was exactly what i wanted i thought all i want to do is just be able to open up unity and sit in there for eight hours a day and just (laughs) like learn you know and that's exactly what happened it felt like drinking through a fire hydrant like it was it was such a a time of rapid growth for myself and um, i feel like my technical knowledge of the engine and gameplay in general just skyrocketed i feel like i can do so many things in unity now um, and the camaraderie and learning from other people. And something that's interesting about game development and working in games full time is it's different than my other jobs. Typically programmers only work with other programmers and then like business people. But what I loved about working at a game studio is it was very cross discipline. You had programmers and artists and designers and business people. And we were all like in the same meetings trying to like rally around this vision of a game and bring it to market and i thought that that part was really rewarding sweet and so you decided to take the leap though away from yep. something you loved yeah I what had, was that yeah i had a i had a, a good income i enjoyed the work that i was doing i was working on a really cool title um it was you might actually know of it it's a it was rift of the necro dancer yeah yeah that's awesome yeah so man it was it was like a a dream project to work on the team was great like um you know i was sitting in in meetings with ryan clark who is like kind of like a a hero in the indie game world Um, yeah yeah but yeah i had i had this rub uh there were a few reasons why i wanted to jump ship one was um i didn't want to just be a programmer I wanted mm. to get my hands dirty in the, the realms of design and art and business. You know, I had a little bit of that entrepreneurial spirit and I wanted to see if I could tackle all of these other domains that go into game development. Um, and then the other really big one was time. Um, I didn't want to be sitting in meetings all day. I didn't want to be tied to my desk. Um, I felt like I could dictate my work day better if I had full autonomy over it. Um, and that's been one of the one of the greatest benefits since um, doing this full time is that 
you know, I can trade a Tuesday for a Saturday or I can work yep. half a day. I can have a long lunch with a buddy and come back and then work until like 11 p.m. if I want to, you know. Um, it takes yep. someone who's really responsible and driven to do that, I think. It really does, yeah. But I've been working remotely uh, for like five years. So I, I was doing it way before the pandemic sent everybody home. Yep. So I already had kind of that foundation for how to be responsible and get my work done without anybody looking over my shoulder. Um, and yeah, when, when I decided to leave my job, uh, my wife was, I think four or five months pregnant at the time. So I kind of had this fire lit under me that, um, you know, baby's on the way, uh, hi, one, I need, you know, income to be able to provide for my growing family. And two, I thought, you know, I don't want, I want to be able to be there for my daughter as she's growing up. You know, I don't want to have to be dictated by the hours that my my job is set for me um, so it's been yep. it's been really awesome to be able to spend time with my daughter um, more time than I think most dads get which has been really cool yep. man okay so are there any things that stress you out about being a full-time game developer oh yeah what, what what's the thing that keeps you awake at night yeah I I will say when I uh, when I was planning to leave my full-time job to make indie games full-time, I was imagining this sense of freedom, like the wind blowing through my hair, just kind of like breathe a sigh of relief, you know, like yep. the, the world is my oyster. And I found out that the day that I left my day job, I was just like, oh man, I feel I, like I felt the weight of it because now it's like, it's all on my shoulders and it not yep. in a bad way because you know there was a lot of stuff going on at the time but i was like yeah like this isn't this isn't fun time this is like let's go time you know yeah. um so so that that has been a good sort of stress um that you know like trying to handle finances trying to make smart dis business decisions about what i spend my time on that's that's a really hard one for me because i'm doing both yeah. game development and trying to grow a youtube channel i'm a little over 7000 subscribers right now and i that's amazing that by yeah. the way just to interrupt you i think your youtube channel is going to be the most profitable thing you do oh you think so that yeah that's really nice thank you uh, and I, I i say this i say this um and I, I have trouble saying this because people misinterpret it. So I'll, I'll say this, my YouTube channel is my most profitable venture. Now, hang tight. Does that mean Thomas doesn't make full-time money and six figures and blah, blah, blah from all of his games? Yes, I do. That just shows you how much profit my YouTube channel brings. If my YouTube channel brings in more profit than all of my games, and that includes investments, that includes publishers, that includes big sale events, hitting the Steam front page, uh, Steam daily deals, Humble Bundle, all that stuff. That's over a million dollars in revenue from my games. Gross revenue, gross. Just so everybody knows, gross revenue. That means that I didn't get all of it, okay? Just so everyone's aware. My YouTube channel outperformed that in two years of, of <laughs> it's hilarious. People think that YouTube is all about ad revenue. It's not. It's about being able to build a brand and have products for sale. Yeah. I mean, the, the top YouTubers in the world, they, they create great content, but on the back end, they've got products being sold all day long. And that's what I do. Everybody knows this. You know, you were one of my students. You bought one of my courses, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's very, very profitable. If you can have digital products available, like uh, courses, resources, coaching, um, assets, software, like like software as a service, mm -hmm. if you could create something like that. There's so much revenue to be made on YouTube that is truly drip income, like a truly, it's it's passive. Like that, that's the power of YouTube. So you've got 8,000 subscribers, you're pulling 3,000 views per video. Mm -hmm. I'll just say this, this is a complete side note, but for anyone who's listening who has 8,000 subscribers or whatever, and you're getting 2,000 views, 3,000 views. Dude, I've got, I got 370,000 subscribers and I'm only swinging at 15,000 views a video. So I don't think I can go, I mean, I can go higher. I sometimes yeah. go higher than that, but I don't try. Yeah. And the reason why is because what I care about is building my business. And, my, and, and if I don't have to get 150,000 views per video to make money, I'm not worried about it. If I'm providing value to people with only 15,000 views, 
that's fine by me. Mm-hmm. As long as my YouTube channel remains profitable for me and my team, I'm happy. Yeah. And so I would highly suggest, highly, highly, highly suggest looking into building products outside of games that you can sell on the side in an automated funnel system with YouTube. Mm -hmm. And I'm very upfront and open with this with all my subscribers. Um, I don't just sell games. That's a whole other venture. My YouTube channel is actually something completely different. Yeah. So there's a you talk about drip income and, and the idea of passive income. Passive income is a wonderful idea. The best way, the best way to generate passive income is not necessarily through games. It's through um, other digital products that, you, that are a little bit more expensive than $5. Yep. Um, and that's generated through organic content like your YouTube videos. Yep. So I'd really look into that, man. Like there's so much, if you want to make some money and you want to help people and teach, because you have a really good personality and you're good at YouTube, obviously. I would really look into that as well. Yeah, that's- We can talk about it after this call if you want. I would love, because when I quit my job, I actually had a threefold plan. I wanted to make games, I wanted to build a YouTube channel, and I wanted to create online courses. Um, Because I have such a deep technical knowledge of game development and Unity Mm -hmm. specifically that I thought, I could definitely give value to people through online courses, but that's what I was leading to before is one of the hardest things is figuring out how to spend my time because I wake up every morning. Nobody's telling me what to do. I have to figure out is my time best spent programming today or is it writing a YouTube script or is it filming or editing or is it, you know, working on this other online course that I want to try and sell. And so it's Mm -hmm. really hard to take all of that and figure out a schedule that makes sense, you know? Um, can I can yeah. I give you? I had all these ideas going through my head about bridges and docks. Yeah. As we wrap up this call, can I give you? You didn't ask for this, but can I give you two? The things that I would do if I were you. Yeah, please. Right now. You you talk about console and you say console is going to be my top performer. Let's pretend it will be. I mm-hmm. don't know if that's true, but let's pretend it will be for bridges and docks. Mm-hmm. Instead of just hoping and and rushing this game out. I would spend two weeks working 100 hours in those both weeks. So I, I would scramble. I would tell your wife and um, your baby girl. It's a daughter, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'd, I'd say, guys, I'm going to see you in two weeks, okay? I love you. Give me two weeks. And I would add in the following to Bridges and Docks, okay? Because you're talking about console, it's going to be a really profitable thing. Well, why not make Bridges and Docks a little, just a, throw in that extra spice? So yeah. what I would do. Okay, what I would do is I would have turtles are on the uh, I would do little tiny turtles. They're just NPCs that hang out and bounce on the island while you're building and they're just cheering you on. Woo! woo, woo. It's like a roller coaster tycoon, right? I don't know if you ever played that game. Uh Yeah. And then every week. So every seven days, seven days being like you have a day night cycle. Yep. Or maybe just a clock at the top. There's a storm that comes in. This is your loop. Storm clouds come in and lightning strikes. Boom, 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 boom. And it attacks your island, right? And then pig pirates come in. So you've got pigs and turtles. And you've got a giant pig face on the 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 boat, the yeah. boats that come in, and they're shooting cannonballs. Boom, boom, boom. Mm-hmm. So it's really just it's it's like an island defense game. Yep. So what's the goal? Get the biggest possible island you can. Yep. If you incorporated a simple loop like that, super simple, so that your island suffers and then you can build it back, yeah. I just feel like there's something, there's something, maybe I'm completely wrong, people in the comments can say what they think. Mm-hmm. But you've got your, your silly, you've got your fun factor, which, yeah. or your silly, silly pigs and silly turtles. You've got, the, you've got the cozy vibes, it's still there, mm-hmm. right? And you've got a loop that's, imagine this, it's beautiful for seven days, seven game days. It's beautiful piano music's playing, you're just placing your stuff, and then you get a countdown, and the the dark strings start playing. And then thunder starts striking, and things start breaking. It's all about preparing for that moment, yeah. for when the storm comes. Yep. I would, I, w- I just wanted to give you that and just say, would you consider just scrambling to make that happen? Because I, has anybody told you that they want more of a loop? 
Or is it just me? Tons of people have said that. Then give it yeah. to them. Yeah. You know, like yeah. you've got something that's, you say, well, I'll just do it for the next game. And I'm yeah. saying, well, if consoles your big, like I wouldn't do it if my console watch was only 30% of my revenue. Yeah. But if it's 70% of your revenue, like you think it's going to be, then why not go in there with a loop? Mm -hmm. Give them the loop. Yep. And see how it goes. You've got, you made an entire game here with this whole system without a loop. And I say, that's like saying I'm going to build an entire house, but there's no door yeah. to get into the house. Yep. You know, um, I, I just feel like you've got to have some kind of loop here. And, and I would I would introduce the, 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 the pirates and the, I love what you said about the turtles. I would bring in the turtles and the pirates, the pig pirates, mm -hmm. and it's pigs versus turtles. Yep. And just go hard with that humor. Yep. And how, what, so you go, okay, well, Thomas said pigs, so I'll just do some some pig pirates. No, do 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 um, a giant snout uh, sail. Yeah. Um, make it so that they're launching pigs from cannons. Yeah. You know, like there's all this stuff you can do with pigs, mm -hmm. and then there's all this stuff you can do with turtles. Yep. It's funny. You can do funny little voices, and you just lean into that fun factor, right? When totally. they explode, that when they explode, little bits of hot dog come out. You know, there's just so much you could do here. Yeah. To make it fun, and I think if if you're if you're the software engineer you you've um, been talking about, you can do it in two weeks. Yeah, that's the, that's the yep. goal. I would really lean into that, man, and just try it. Yeah. Just try it because I look at this game and I see some. I I'll be honest with you, I see something something like a missed opportunity mm -hmm. because the loop is a loop is is a loop is everything for a game. I think. Yep. Now I'm not a cozy gamer, so maybe I don't know. Yeah. No, I think that that's really good advice, and I I'll have to I'll have to think through that. But I I like the idea of spitting out a quick idea of a game loop with combat and something that gives the player motivation to continue playing. Uh, in in replacement of just their own inspiration of this, you know, fanciful island that they want to create. I think that the game well, that you described sounds super fun. I think so too. Yeah. And I think that you, you, you would have a currency of some kind. Mm -hmm. um, what's a currency that turtles would use? You know, that's the, I love thinking about themes like this because you can just throw in so many stupid puns. Yeah. Exactly. Like um, little shells or something, which is hilarious because yeah. it's like, why would I use the corpse of a turtle for my currency yeah, right but like you could you could come up with a currency and and then if if the player is at risk of losing all that they built mm -hmm. they work hard to protect it yeah and it makes it valuable right scarcity creates value totally. if you don't have scarcity in a game it's not valuable yeah it's it's pretty yeah. but it's not valuable yep and there's a like even beauty in real life Beauty is valuable in real life because why? It's scarce. Mm -hmm. Like, there's only a few really beautiful people in the world. Mm -hmm. The rest of us are ugly. <laughs> so beauty is scarce. And so scarcity in game design is so important. Even in a cozy game, when there's scarcity, it makes you th strive in that cozy environment to make something beautiful yeah. and build something big and awesome yeah. and do better than than your previous version of yourself. That's exciting. Totally. So that's what I would do with Bridges and Docks. Yeah. And I wouldn't even go Bridges and Docks, Pigs versus Pirates. I wouldn't do that. I would just say, nope, it's called Bridges and Docks. And I'm gonna update the Steam version when the console launches. Yep. I would just try it. Yeah. Dude, what if you took, I'm so excited here, but <laughs> it's okay if you don't do any of this. Uh -huh. What if you took Pigs, or, or what if you took that visual of the Pigs launching themselves out of cannons? at your island and the piece is breaking. What if you took a, 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 a video of that, just that mechanic, just mm -hmm. do that one first, mm -hmm. post it on Twitter and say, should I implement this into Bridges and Docks? Yes yeah. or no? Yeah. What do you think they're gonna say? Yeah, 100%. And we'll see, maybe yeah. they'll say no. Maybe yeah. they'll be like, that's stupid, I like it cozy, mm -hmm. you know? Right. So yeah. I would just maybe spend three hours doing that, create some kind of quick prototype. Yeah. Can you can you do that? Can you Can you launch a sphere? And then when it hits a, a block, it disappears. Hundred percent. Yeah, you've got an erase function, right? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So what you've created is you've created this entire system yep. for building and breaking islands, yet there's no, there's no threatening thing that will do that for you. Mm -hmm. It's you. So why not implement something outside of you, the creator, yep. so the evil force that comes in and actually adds a little bit of destruction mm -hmm. and see what happens. Yeah. I like that you idea know? a lot. So, and you're talking about, well, okay, how do I, how do I get all my time? Or, or this is, I only have so much time to do stuff. Yep. Well, if you've built an entire game, an entire system, shouldn't, wouldn't it be smart to just, wouldn't it be a very low risk thing to jump in there for two weeks and add this as opposed to start another game? Right. Totally. I think that's wise. I could yep. be wrong. Maybe I don't understand your strategy yep. as well as you do. Yep. I'm, I'm doing the same thing with my last game. My last game was a, a tanks party uh, shoot 'em up game. And I'm, I'm making a spinoff with, because I basically have like a, a tank system that's built mm. into it. And so that's, that's going to be super small. I'm not, I'm just spending some, some, I, I call it fun Fridays. I spend Fridays working on that game. So. Yeah. Well, okay. So are you thinking maybe you could create a game called Turtles and Pigs and it's just a complete separate one from this or? Yeah, I'd have to, man, I'd have to really think about that because I like the idea a lot. I, I think, I think you're very correct that it does need something extra to appeal to more people and make the game loop really fun for people. Yeah. It just depends on how what that looks like. I really like the idea of having a wave system and you know destroying mm -hmm. parts of the islands. I think that that's really cool. So I I will well, definitely things, consider things are, it. Yeah, for sure. And you don't have to do anything. But I will just say this: cozy, cozy is multiplied when there's a threat. In my opinion. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what's the coziest? What which one's cozier? Being under a blanket watching a TV show on a warm summer night? Or is it cozier when there's a thunderstorm rolling in? Mm -hmm. You yep. know, that, that, maybe that's just me, yep. but, or a candle, a candle is, there's a candle behind you. Mm -hmm. A candle is beautiful in a dim room, yep. not a bright sunny room. Yep. And so I, I look at games like Bridges and Docks and I say, what if, e what if every 20 minutes that storm rolls in and it yeah. pours rain yeah and it causes some kind of damage that you've got to protect yourself from yeah so that those next seven days are especially cozy right what if this was an oasis and the outside world is dangerous and it's trying to get to you i love it yeah i love it yeah that's awesome. so what your game i think what your game is missing is contrast yeah it's, and and that's that's contrast in 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 mechanics of like a threatening mechanic and also in in every once in a while bringing in a dark mood. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing I want to say. The second thing I want to say is really lean into your YouTube channel, yeah. um, and consider and consider selling digital products. Um, a lot of people feel gross about selling their own like courses and stuff, mm -hmm. but it's like I, if I want to learn from somebody, I want to learn from somebody I know. Yeah. And so I follow you on YouTube. I would love to learn from you mm -hmm. because I know you. Mm -hmm. I've I've watched all your videos. You know. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, it's something that is definitely something you, you could consider. Yeah. You have done better than most game developers out there. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, you've done significantly better than most because you have follow through. Yeah. You have yeah. a, a style, your games are solid. Mm -hmm. Um, and your YouTube, your YouTube channel is really growing. And so that's a really good question, isn't it? What should you focus on? Yeah. That's Where do you focus one. your time? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you think you should focus on? I It differs from day to day. You know, I was actually lamenting yesterday about, I looked at my YouTube channel and it's been 45 days since I posted a video. And that just, I feel like I'm kind of letting that slip through the cracks right now. And I, I know that I, there's videos out there that I want to be making. And I know that people want to engage with what I'm doing and stay up to date, you know, and uh, even even if it's just like a normal devlog, but I've also been doing yeah. a lot of fun things that I that I think I could um, talk about in videos and stuff. But um, you know, it's like it's hard because when I when I'm actively doing development, you know, I have a lot of stuff to talk about in my YouTube videos, devlogs that fun features that I'm adding or whatever. Mm -hmm. When I'm when I'm working like right now, I'm working on porting this game to Xbox, and one all of that is under NDA, so I can't show anything. And two, most of it is very 
technical and not interesting anyway you know so it's like I, yeah. i'm constantly pulled between this like youtube which i consider my marketing effort and then like game development or programming which is necessary but not always interesting so yep that's the thing is is uh youtube youtube is is a it's a time suck yeah and everyone wants <laughs> a lot of people want youtubers to do it just because they love it yeah they don't want youtubers to be um getting something in return mm -hmm. and if you were getting something in return if you were getting paid let's say five grand a month mm -hmm. to make three videos a month you would probably do it right totally so <sighs> that's the thing is if you had an incentive to do it it doesn't it shouldn't devalue the quality of the videos yeah exactly and it shouldn't change the content but it just means that you're more consistent totally so can I ask creating you? that in yeah, yeah go ahead I'm, I'm so you've you've seen my YouTube channel and something that I found mm -hmm. one of the takeaways that I found doing YouTube is like I used to do more project oriented videos like I made one video where I recreated Super Mario Bros in unity and I did mm -hmm. one video where um, I made like a game jam game where you're like this little acorn guy running around treetops in 48 hours and I made another yep. video where I 3d scanned my old truck and put it into Mario Kart so that I could drive around cool. my own truck in Mario Kart you know and all of these videos got like 300 views you know and so then I realized once I started talking about like my own process and like how much money I'm making if I mention money anywhere then people will mm -hmm. click on these videos and I'm trying yep. to figure out like what is a good i like you you are much better at youtube than i am so you looking at my not channel really. how would, i don't know i feel like you're like you're one of dude i got 300 i got 380,000 subscribers and i'm only getting three times as many views as you which is you yeah. know it's like it sounds like a lot but it's not it's like you, your latest video got 3.5 thousand views yeah my latest video got 15,000 so it's like yeah. It's not that big of a difference relative yeah. to the size of the audience. Yeah. That's, so you're doing great. That's a fair point. Yeah. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out what a, like, what's my North Star that I should be aiming with with my YouTube content? Because uh -huh. it, it used to be when I was doing it part time, I was just making project oriented videos. And then I moved into more of like more behind the scenes, like here, I'm this guinea pig guy who quit his job let me give you a peek behind the curtain so that you have like a realistic view of what mm -hmm. it what it's like behind the scenes and all of the yeah. things that i'm all the struggles and obstacles that i'm in, encountering and all of that let um, me i could give you the answer yeah i figured it out two weeks ago and it's going to potentially blow your mind but maybe yeah. not um alex ramosi is pretty popular i don't know if you follow him yeah i've seen him he changed his content style. Have you seen this? Mm -mm. He changed it to long form content where he just talks into a microphone. There's no crazy edits anymore. Mm -hmm. There's no clickbait titles. He, the reason why is he doesn't care about views. Do you know what he cares about? He cares about opt-ins. He cares about subscriber, true subscribers, not subscribers yeah. on YouTube. Yeah. He cares about subscribers to his fan base, his private fan base. Mm -hmm. So it could be a membership. It could be an email list. It could be wish lists. I love email. Email addresses are the greatest thing ever because it that's a true audience. Like YouTube subscribers, it's not that they have a problem. It's that YouTube's algorithm doesn't even help. Like it doesn't really pitch your content to YouTube subscribers. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of does sometimes. It depends on the channel. But I found that I don't care about views as much and I don't care about subscribers on YouTube. I care about the people. I just don't care about the number. Yeah. I, I don't care about views or the number of subscribers. What I care about is true fans, yep. ones who have been, uh, who have opted into my email list, or who have wish listed my game. Now, why? And I'm I'm speaking purely from a business perspective here. Okay, so everybody who thinks this sounds really sleazy, I'm just thinking purely about a business. I got employees. I got a, I got bills to pay. What is the value of an email list or wish lists? Well, the value is they convert into revenue eventually. A few. The rest of them, you just provide value. But there are, to them, like tons of value, right? Mm -hmm. uh, demo on Steam, right? Um, free content, free newsletters, blah, blah, blah. Yep. But 
a, a, a truly warm, a truly warm fan on an email list or a wish list on steam. And by the way, a wish list on steam is like the same thing as an email list. It's just valve owns that you don't. Mm -hmm. The true value there is that these are people who will, a few people, a few people will eventually convert into a sale. So you'll sell a game or you'll sell a product or whatever, okay? Mm -hmm. So you're sitting here going, well, what's my North Star? Well, if you're, if you're not married and you don't have kids and you don't have bills to pay, then your North Star is just create great content and just be okay with that. But in my opinion, I think a lot of game developers foolishly seek clout for clout's sake, views for views' sake, um, when in reality, it's a lot easier to stay motivated. It's a better long-term strategy to think like a business and to think, well, okay, what's my revenue model? Um, how, do we, how do we continue to make four videos a month and that helps us pay our bills? Mm -hmm. Point is this. It's a lot easier to be consistent on YouTube and to figure out what your content is when you know what generates revenue. Mm -hmm. This can be really, really bad though because it can cause your content to become stale and awful. Right. So you have to be careful with this. But some of the most consistent YouTubers out there are the ones who have a business behind the operation. Mm -hmm. So I would, you ask, what's my, what's my North Star? I would say your North Star should be something like, I need 10,000 wish lists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because if I have 10,000 wish lists, I know I'll make $20,000. Mm -hmm. And that actually, I think that number's correct. Maybe I'm wrong here. Mm -hmm. um, let's say you sell a $5 game, 10,000 wish lists. The $5 is tough because you, that's about half of the typical price of a game. Mm -hmm. But if it's 10,000, you have 10,000 wish lists at a 10% at a conversion rate, we'd probably be 15% conversion. So that's um, 10,000 times 0.15. That's 1,500 sales mm -hmm. times $5. That's 7,500 bucks, okay? Mm -hmm. So you're probably gonna aim for more. But yep. point being though, if your aim is wish lists, then you know my aim is 10,000 wish lists. Yep. That's Ten, basically 10 grand on launch. Yep. How many videos do I need to launch with a call to action to wish list to get that number? Mm -hmm. Well, how would you know? Well, you would say, what does one video do? Well, let's do a test video. We'll do a test video. If it gets 5,000 views, how many wish lists do I get with a call to action at one minute? Mm -hmm. So do you think, see how everything's very systematic? Right, it, it's very metrics driven, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people listening might now will go, man, Thomas is so sleazy, where did he get all this? This is what YouTubers do. Like YouTubers are posting content consistently over and over and over again because they, they understand that number one, they're providing value for their audience, they're building a great fan base, they're building a community, it's fun, but there's also a consistent revenue stream that is it's basically the law of averages. Mm -hmm. You're just gonna get that revenue because it's just the way it is. Yeah. So your North Star should be converting someone to a warm lead. That's, yep. that's really, and I'm gonna run an ad at the end of this podcast. Take a look at my webinar, blah, blah, blah. Every, every, every YouTuber does something like this, mm -hmm. okay? Some YouTubers, what they do is they take a sponsorship from Skillshare. Yep. Okay, well, th they aren't getting leads, but who is? Skillshare. Right. So YouTube or organic content in general on social media has always been um, sort of the entry point for sales. Mm -hmm. And so you can, maybe you're getting a version of Thomas you don't like right now. I don't know, but. Which Thomas? Um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm trying to convert you into a sleazy businessman here. <laughs> no, but I, I think, think, I think. I'm trying to survive I, out I think, here. I know, yep. I mean, everybody listening is. Yep. And so some people will write negative comments like Thomas is, is selling this and I hate that. And I'm like, this is why you guys are getting consistent content though. Yep. The reason I post consistently is because it provides income for my team. Yeah. That's, that's a, it's not the only reason, but it's a big reason. Yeah. A big reason why YouTubers, like some of our favorite YouTubers, you're like, why is it they post every day? How are they so consistent? How do they stay so motivated? And their content is always so precise. Mm -hmm. 
revenue. That's it. Yeah. And so if you can think what you said, what's my North star, your North star should be it. This will make it easier for you, especially as a father mm -hmm. and as a, as a husband and as a businessman, your North star should be, I want to create content that captures the audience that will convert to a sale. Now mm -hmm. you may, that sounds bad, because it's like all you care about is making money. It, no, I, if, I, if I can create content that captures a specific audience that converts to sales, that means that audience found value in what I'm doing. Yeah. And so really it helps you create valuable content. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's interesting because I think what other people do that I find, like the, the thing that you might run into is if you are running after money, you you might come off as disingenuous. And not you in mm -hmm. particular, but I mean anybody who's like trying to sell anything, right? Like yeah. like a car salesman, you know, that they, they're really nice to you, but you but they're not actually nice. They right. want you to buy from them. And so I think yep. like with YouTube, right now I'm trying to build a channel built off of like authenticity and mm -hmm. because I think mm -hmm. that people really like that, you know, and it's like People want to see what's actually genuine about the things that I'm working on. And I think that yeah. these values of authenticity and genuineness are super helpful and it builds trust, you know? And mm -hmm. so I think yeah. that, that that's kind of like the line that I'm trying to find where it's like, yeah, I need to pay my bills, but I don't want to come off as a, as a car salesman, you know? So I think yep. that's kind of the rub. Well, the rule is, and this is something I've changed my entire approach to sales. Like when it comes to my channel and promoting my own products, um, I think it was last month we stopped doing it completely because we just felt, I didn't feel, I felt gross about it, mm. to be honest. So then the question is like, well, how do you, how do you, then what do you do? Mm -hmm. Well, the answer is you sell, you sell privately to people who care. Yeah. You don't, you don't, you don't up and just like, imagine if you said, Hey, I'm a game developer. I'm Thomas Stewart. And I, my game is, my game is 50% off. And you did a video about your game 50% off. Mm -hmm. That's not going to work yeah. because only 1% of the people watching your video give a crap. Yep. The rest of them are like, I'm clicking off. You're wasting my time. Yep. So the idea is, is to, to, to find the people who really do want to buy your game. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? How do you find people who really do want to buy your game? Do you know? Well, if it's on a medium like YouTube, you have to have some sort of funnel for them to opt in to hear more about mm -hmm. you. Yeah, that's right. So all you're doing, all you do is you say, I just launched five games. And then in the first 30 seconds you say, oh, and by the way, you can click below if you wanna play the demo. Mm -hmm. That's it. And the way they play the demo is they either wish list it or they give you an email address. Yep. That's it. Yep. Now you don't just sell to them with an email address. That's ridiculous. You mm -hmm. continue to give them valuable content. Yep. And the rule is one out of every four emails, you can say, hey, by the way, the game is for sale. Mm -hmm. So eventually you have to sell. Yep. I mean, it's like every game developer needs to realize this. Um, every YouTuber needs to realize this. You're not gonna keep creating games and you're not gonna keep creating content if you don't make money. Mm -hmm. Because you're, you're eventually gonna have to go get a job yep. and you're not gonna have the time to do it. Yep. So you've got to sell. You have to create calls to action. You've just gotta figure out a way to do it ethically, honestly, genuinely, and generously. Generosity is the number one way to sell, okay? Mm -hmm. If I give some, this is why demos are so valuable on Steam. If you give out a super generous demo, by generous I mean it's, it's free, obviously, but mm -hmm. it's 30 minutes long, it's gorgeous, highly polished, and you give it out during Steam Next Fest, what's gonna happen? You're gonna get 100,000 wish lists and you're gonna sell a ton of copies when it launches. So that's the same thing that Costco does. They're giving you just, all, it's like, I just hate 10 samples at Costco. Yep. I feel like I stole something from them. Yep. What, well, what happens? Well, you end up buying what you got. Yeah. You know? And I feel like I got a, such a good deal because I only paid $1.50 for lunch because I bought one of their <laughs> hot dogs, but then I walked away spending $300 on other groceries. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And so is that manipulative of Costco? No, because I feel like I benefited from yeah. it. Yeah. 
That's right. So commerce, the, the best form of commerce is when both parties are feel like they got something. Yeah. Um, and so you want to do the same with your, your YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. You want to give so much good, good content away. Like this podcast, for example, I just, I just get, we just talked for an hour and 20 minutes and the people who, li who are still listening right now got an hour and 20 minutes of just great content. Mm -hmm. At the end of this podcast, they're going to hear me say, Hey, if you want to check out my webinar below, click below. And I'm going to get an email address from like 0.1% of the people who listened. Mm -hmm. Those people genuinely want to learn from Thomas. And so those people genuinely might want to trade value with me. They might want to say, Hey, you know what? I do want to learn from Thomas's course, but I'm not going to pitch it now. I wouldn't pitch my course now. I used to do that. That's horrible. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to pitch now because people don't want to hear that right now. But the people who, who, who communicated with me that, Hey, I want to learn from you more. Mm -hmm. I want to take it one step further. Those are the only people I worry about. So when people think about steam wish lists, they don't fully understand that it's all it is. All it is is a sales funnel. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's an email list that, that valve owns. And then they, they, they send emails out saying when a game's on sale. Yep. Um, so again, back to your North, North star question, what's the North star of my, my YouTube channel? Mm -hmm. What do you have to offer at the end of the day? What do you have to offer to sell? Um, it's a dangerous question. It is dangerous because you could create content that's stupid and <laughs> sleazy just to make money. Mm -hmm. So you've got to figure out the balance there. But at the end of the day, a YouTube channel is a business. Yep. Um, it really is. And it's a wonderful business. It's, it's just the greatest thing ever because you can, I could sit here and give an hour and 20 minutes of just great conversation with Thomas, Thomas and Thomas and tons of value Yeah. as opposed to in the nineties. It's like buy my hour, hour long conversation with Thomas Stewart for just $20 and right. we'll ship you the DVD. Right. It's like nowadays, it's like, no, you just listen. And then at the end, if you want to learn more about Thomas and learn from Thomas, you can take a look at his webinar and that's it. That's how it works. Or if you want to, if you want to wish list that person's game, 1% of you will do that. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? hundred percent. Yeah. Do you have calls to action in your videos? Yeah, I do. I, I try okay. not to do too many because it's like, I don't want to like, Usually I'll stick them at the end and I try and pick one because I don't want to be like, mm -hmm. oh, buy my game, also subscribe, also follow me on, or uh, contribute to my Patreon, also join my mm -hmm. Discord. You know, it's like I try and pick like one I know. thing. Yeah. Patreon's interesting. So I wouldn't, never try and, not, this is a new rule for me. Never try and make a dollar, a single dollar from a YouTube video. So when, when people call out, support us on Patreon, mm -hmm. I don't know if I like that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm trying to make a rule for myself, which is don't ever ask for money in a video. Mm. Try and give something away. So it's like, for example, hey, you can play my demo yeah. by, by clicking the link below. Well, when they click the link below, it's you can play the demo for free or you can play an extended demo for $5 a month on Patreon. Oh, you know, sure. something like that. Mm -hmm where it's, there's always stuff to give away. There's, 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 you're being very, very generous. Um, and we, we, ha we have the flexibility to be generous in this era mm -hmm. because organic content is so valuable. Yeah. Like if you can get, look, I'm looking at your videos right now, 31,000 views on that video, I quit my job. Mm -hmm. That's it, that, that's crazy to think in the 90s that you could do that or the early 2000s. Right. 30,000 people yeah. learned about this random guy named Thomas Stewart. Yeah, it's crazy. So you, you, we have the freedom now with organic content to be extremely generous with what we give away. Mm -hmm. um, very, very generous, with long videos, tons of value, even free demos and free this and free that. Just give, mm -hmm. give, 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 give. Because if 0.1 or 0.05, if, if half a percentage of those people actually convert into a sale, you're making some money. Mm -hmm. and, and at the end of the day, that's how you stay afloat as a game developer yep. and as a YouTuber. Yeah, so, nice. That's sorry if that was a little bit of a rant. I, I've been learning a lot in the last two months about what the, yeah. what the North Star should be. Yeah, um, I love that. It's tough.
Yeah, I it, and it's super applicable to me, you know, because I, you know, I've saved up a financial runway, you know, and I'm making some money, which extends my financial runway, but I, I'm still not at a point where I'm like, oh, I get to do this full time for the rest of my life. I'm still trying to yep. figure out, you know, how to be, how to stay afloat. So I this these sorts of conversations are super helpful for me. If you make, I'll, I'll close with this. If bridges and docks can make you a, fu- a full-time salary for one year, what you've just achieved is a credibility marker. You've officially achieved that. Mm-hmm. Then, if you want to, you can then coach and, and teach half a percentage of your audience on YouTube, and that will be additional income. Mm-hmm. I, point being, I wouldn't try and sell a course or resources or anything like that yeah. until you hit that marker. Mm-hmm. That Because that credibility marker of, I made a full-time salary yeah. from my games and I could teach you how to do it too. Yeah. That's very valuable for your audience. Your audience will go, man, I wanna learn from Thomas. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Um, so it's just something to think about, which is prioritize. Uh, what I would do if I were you right now is I would prioritize your YouTube channel mm-hmm. for wish lists and sponsorships See if you can get a, uh, a almost full time, like forty thousand dollars a year from sponsorships. Mm-hmm. You might be able to pull that off. Yeah, that'd be great. And Thanks. also prioritize getting some wish lists. Yeah, and that's that's how I would build your business. And this is a purely a business conversation. Mm-hmm. What we're talking about right now. This is not community. This is not adding value to your audience. Or, or I'm, I'm sorry, not adding value. It's it's not about purely only just building a YouTube channel and, and just loving it. I'm talking about the business side. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a whole other side to the equation, which is do what you love and enjoy it and, and yep. lean into your forte and be creative and have fun. Definitely. So. Yeah, but I've been amazed yeah. how much, uh, I thought that I would have to have like what you what you said before about having that credibility of, oh, I made enough money to fund my studio for another year um, yeah. before you know, trying to teach other people about this stuff. I feel more comfortable with the technical stuff. I could probably teach, yeah. you know, how to make a game pretty easily. But mm-hmm. um, but it's funny, just having a YouTube channel, um, how many people reach out to me and send me messages and they're like, hey, like I want advice about this or like, how did you do this? You know, so like there are yeah. lots of people that are, I, I still think of myself as early on along the game development path, but there's so mm-hmm. many people that are just starting that they're, they don't know what like the first step is, you know? And yeah. so, um, Oh yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of, yeah, for a lot sure. of people out there that want to be able to make games, which is cool. Well, I'm super happy for you, Thomas. I think, I think you're, you're doing incredible. Um, you're pulling some good views and I think, I think your YouTube channel is definitely something you should prioritize. Yeah. Um, awesome. I'm interested to see if you had the time. I'm interested to see, um, well, I, you know, you don't have to do anything I've mentioned, but I, I am interested to see Bridges and Docks on console. Yeah. Um, and see how that performs. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. Cool, man. Well, guys, links in the description for Bridges and Docks and also Thomas's channel. Thomas, is there anything else you wanted to close with, man? Man, no, I just really appreciate it. I love these conversations. I love talking about mm-hmm. game development, you know, all the technical stuff, the marketing stuff, the business stuff. Um, I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, thanks for having me on. Yeah, dude. Take it easy. Cheers. See ya. Hey, friend, I want to see you succeed as a game developer. I want to see you make a full-time salary as a game developer. See, the thing is, most game developers don't know how to actually make money with their game. And believe it or not, you can actually make a full-time salary with just a demo. I've done this three freaking times. And I'm going to teach you exactly how to do that. Make a full-time salary with just a demo. Click the link below. It's a webinar. Totally free. No gimmicks here. Check it out, watch the whole thing. You're gonna learn a ton and you're gonna learn how to make six figures with just a demo. Cheers.